thanks for coming. Uh, what we're going to talk today is uh, the uh, relay-b uh, daemon that runs on OpenBSD, which um, we'll use as a specific use case, which is a partition layer getaway, uh, also known as reverse proxy in most of the time. So quickly, who am I? I've uh, been uh, sys uh, sysadmin since the last, uh, well, since uh, the uh, late uh, 90s. Uh, in 2015, I started working as a freelance, uh, as a technical architect, which in France means uh, I'm doing mostly diagrams and throwing them at uh, operators so that they, in they implement this. Uh, I tend to quite uh, self host every self, uh, services that I can. I mean, like email, whatever. Uh, I can take it at home or, or uh, on a VPS. And most of the time, I do it using OpenBSD. <coughs> There's a few things that I run on Linux that last running for the moment. But nearly 99% uh, of what I run uh, runs on OpenBSD. And if you ever stumble to that URL, uh, that probably if you're not French, you won't be able to pronounce. Uh, this is where I uh, write articles about mostly FOSS. And most of the time it's about OpenBSD, like how do you do whatever we're using OpenBSD, how do you do this, how do you do that. So uh, what is ReadyD? So it's a multipurpose uh, daemon. It's available on OpenBSD since version 4.3, although it was named host, uh, I can't pronounce this thing, uh, host stated uh, in OpenBSD 4.1. It can do several things. It can do load balancing, it can do a partition layer getaway, and it can do transparent pro proxy. That is, for example, if you want to connect to a remote SSH server, you can do it um, via RelayD. Uh, we're not going to do this today. What we're going to do is the application layer getaway, which basically looks like the diagram on the right. What, uh, in general and simplified, what a network looks like is that the user is somewhere on the internet or, or in the intranet or whatever, and you got several zones in your IT. Uh, there's probably one zone with the firewall, which do the all the filtering, what's allowed to go in, what's allowed to go out. Then most of the time there's another zone, someone, someone sometimes called a DMZ, where you put your hardware like WAF and things like that. And this is probably where you would uh, put your relay server. And then uh, far in the, uh, in the LAN zones, you will have your, let's call them backend server, whatever, where, where even if those are like web servers and considered front application servers in the application layer, but we'll call them backend servers. And those are where your services run. And this is what is exposed by the uh, relay server. So first of all, a uh, few things about RelayD. Uh, what you have to do, should do, must do, is read a few main pages. Uh, the main page for the daemon itself is RelayD. The configuration file uh, has its own main page uh, with loads of things inside. Uh, you probably need a few readings to get uh, all around it. It's called RelayD.conf. And there's a specific uh, utility which calls uh, relay, relay control, which allows you to well, control the uh, the daemon, um, and that consists of getting information on what ha what's happening on the relay D session. And sometimes, well, sometimes you can also provoke uh, action like tell relay D to stop relaying things, uh, switch to other uh, backend server, etc. We'll have a look later on. The configuration uh, file is named etcreallyd.conf. There's uh, an example file that you can get from the uh, etc example directory. Um, and then when that's all done, you can control the daemon using those kind of uh, commands. Relayd-dvn 
uh, basically will check the configuration of your RelayD uh, server and will yell at you if there's errors. So it allows you to correct them bef b uh, before the starting the daemon, then it stops and then you've got no service at all. When the configuration is good, you can start um, the, the daemon, so you got the uh, C control command and they will start scope like any daemons in, uh, in OpenBSD. And the relay uh, control command uh, is, I've not written all the commands, all, all the available commands because there's loads of them, but it's basically relay control give uh, a command to run and then arguments to that command. We'll have an example at the end of the, uh, the slides. <coughs> Uh, about the words used in the uh, configuration, one thing to note is that if you all, if you're already used to PF syntax and words and stuff like that, it's mo mostly the same with uh, ReadyD, so you won't be what, surprised with the words very similar. Basically, what we're going to use here is macro, which has, which are variables that you can use several times in the uh, in the configuration. The tables are like objects where you put your reference server or group of servers and then you decide what to do with uh, those groups. The protocol is where you will say, you will define what happens to what kind of protocol you have. You can have basically TLS protocol, HTTP protocol, uh, there's probably DNS protocol, and there's probably one more I forgot. Anyway, we are only going to look at the HTTP protocol in this uh, talk. And then the relays are the, the sections that says uh, where you listen to a request, what you do with it, and who uh, I, um, are they gonna send it, referring soon to the uh, backend servers. So that's the simplest uh, HTTP rel configuration that you can get. It's a HTTP reverse proxy, it's, uh, there's a really few few lines. What you do is you define a protocol of the type HTTP. So that's the HTTP first word. Protocol is just telling you that it's a protocol. And www is the name you can use. You can do whatever you want with the names. There may be issues if you try to use uh, underscore dash. There was something sometimes that mm, there was weird things happening. So just try not to use them. And when you define the, the protocol is here, is just saying, take something as a request and pass it to the server, do nothing anymore. Then what you define is the relay section, where you tell relay where to, to listen to. Mm, so that's an, I, an IP example with a port. You tell them to use that protocol that we've just defined up uh, in the configuration. And then you tell them to forward all the requests to that particular backend server using the the particular port of the uh, of the server. In this configuration, we are all using uh, eight zero, but you can barely use whatever port you want. What you call namespaces? Oh, the names don't have to match. You can have relay name foo and the protocol name bar. And the, the only thing is that your protocol has to have that particle name. I've used uh, www just to get an idea of what we're doing, but we could, we could define a HTTP protocol John and say uh, relay is like Tom or whatever. There's no, no problem with it. Uh, what I call a better simple uh, HTTP relay uh, we're using macro here, as in PF, we got an uh, external address which represents the public IP of our servers. We define uh, a variable called webhost and we get the private IP for this. The idea is that it will be usable inside the rest of the configuration. We have uh, basic logging information in this. Log state changes means that the log will tell you every time uh, a server, a backend server goes up and down. For example, uh, the table here, you define a uh, table name webhost. 
and this is the name of the object. I could have also named it John or whatever. Uh, and you say, this table contains one single object, which is the web host server that has the IP defined up there. And the only thing that changed uh, on from the previous uh, example is that now we are listening on the variable named um, external address rather than the setting up the, the IP directly in the relay configuration. And same thing happens for the uh, forward directive. It may not make lots of sense right here because we're only using the variable once. But if you want to define a more relays than this and keep using the external address, for example, then you will only reference the macro in the configuration and will have to change only the, the definition of the macro on the top of the file. As for now, we've been using only HTTP. So what happens if you want to activate TLS? The idea is that you activate the TLS on the relay day and these backend server can still be using HTTP if that's okay for you. The thing to do is, first of all, is to get a TLS certificate, which is out of the scope of this talk because this is done using uh, the ACME tools and the HTTPD server. So if you want to get a certificate, just look at the main page where I've aimed the uh, example uh, files, uh, configuration files. It's quite str straightforward. What you will get is files like, um, like the pink names. You will get etcssl and certificate name .crt and the same thing in the private, the uh, key extension. The thing is that in the, the protocol section, you'll have to reference those files. And this is what the TLS key pair uh, function is, uh, does. And what you'll see is that what I'm referencing is relay.example, which is the exact uh, name of the certificate without the extension. And by default, what uh, relay will do is that it will look for a certificate that has this particular name and adds the extension to locate the servers. There are some other uh, possibilities for naming the certificate. I didn't went into this because uh, it would be a bit complicated sometimes. There's a whole section in the, in the main page that explains what you can do. Basically, you can have um, you can have IPs or ports in the in the file name. Uh, then the other change is that in the relay section, you're not listening to uh, HTTP, but you're now uh, using the TLS option and uh, hopefully uh, changing the port. And this is just what is necessary to go from the HTTP file to the HTTPS configuration. Now, uh, most of the time you will have, or on spe specifically if you tell for strings, but in real environment, you will probably have several backend servers. And what you want is that if you have three application servers and one goes down, you want to uh, stop using it, stop sending requests to them and uh, concentrate on the two that are still working. So for this, we're gonna create uh, a specific table which has the same name as previously but we're referencing three hosts which means by default uh, Relody will, uh, will use those three hosts to send uh, information to or HTTP request to and we'll get answer from, from them. And then in the, uh, so there's nothing to change there in the protocol section for yet. Uh, in the Relody section this is where you are going to tell that um, Relody to forward all the requests to that particular table, and you have options to, uh, let's say, uh, different scheduling uh, algorithm to tell him, do you want to use like source IP, which means the same uh, client will get will get through the same uh, backend server, or do you want to use round robin uh, algorithm, or there's there's quite a few uh, algorithm. They're all detailed in the uh, configuration, but they're they are classical ones. And there's another thing that you can do or not is uh, use the checks. That, that is, uh, RelayD can regularly check if the server, the backend server, is up and running, and this is how it decides if it continues to use it. So for example here, we're sending uh, a request with slash health check, 
uh, to the server every every five uh, five seconds, which is the value of the interval uh, um, value. And if Relady gets uh, an HTTP res uh, response of 300, then it will consider that the server is alive and continue to use it. If for some reason we get like HTTP error uh, 500, then the server will be dropped and will never be used until it gets another 200 uh, uh, response. Another thing you can do is use uh, fallback servers. Fallback servers is uh, either a server or a group of server that will be used in case the other group is not working. Think of it as like a, um, like like when you get uh, that that particular uh, error message that your application has has died, you only get um, you get HTTP errors, and you don't want to get this. You, you, you don't want your user to get this message. What you want your user to, to get is the we're coming soon uh, web page. So you can use uh, fallback this way. You define a first uh, table with the production server. You define another table, which here we've called uh, fallback, that points to another server, another URL. And in the, um, in the real section, you get two forwards directly. You got the first which is the same, which you say by default forward every request to the servers referencing the web host uh, table uh, using, in this case, the round robin um, algorithm. And if the both server stops replying HTTP 200 to relay day, then you can switch back to the server reference in the uh, fallback table which could probably be a simple HTTP server with a single page that says we're on trouble, we're, we're, we're working on it, come later. In this configuration, the fallback will be automatic. Th this means that the first production servers, there are two, so they, they'll, get, uh, they'll get all the requests in the round robin mode. If the first server, so let's say web host uh, two, fails, all the requests will go to uh, the web server one. And if for no reasons or for some reasons, uh, host one also dies, then RelayD will notice them and forward all the requests to that uh, third server. And this is when, as a user, you will see that static page or whatever you decided to. There are some times you don't want that uh, automatic behavior to happen. For example, mostly in uh, business continuity plan, you may want to check things bef before re redirecting your users to another server. For example, if those are remote servers, so that implies latency and you don't want this until you're sure that the uh, primary servers are dead, or when those are neutralized server because they're not supposed to, to get all the charge from the users, but you want you want to be sure that that's the right thing to do. In this case, and that's the second uh, yellow line, you can set the disable uh, options to the, ta to, the, um, to the table. And this will s uh, tell RelayD to not do the automatic switch. So what it will do is uh, send the request to host one and two. If one of those hosts fail, the all the requests will get to the uh, remaining server, and if those two servers die, then really they will stop follow, uh, sending requests to any any other servers. And you will have to do a manual operation so that if the, the new uh, request will go to the fallback servers. So here's here's an example of what um, I was describing. Uh, you can see how you can use the uh, relay control uh, command. Here we say relay control show summary, and what it's wh what this does is that it tells you basically what happens. So we can hear that we can see that the um, the relay that we've named uh, WWTLS for the moment is active. All the two hosts that we've configured are working, and the fallback uh, table has been disabled by default. So in this case which what this means is that the two primary servers are working and our services working properly. 
Now, when failure happens, in this case, we, lo we lose the two servers in one shot. If you use the relayctl uh, command, what it will tell you is that the both the hosts are now down. The first re relay is still active, but there's nothing going through there. So in this particular case, there's absolutely no service for your users. So this is where you get the HTTP error, uh, 500 or things like that. What you will have to do to re-enable the service and switch back to the uh, fallback servers is run a command like relay uh, control table enable two. Uh, table two is the fallback table. And what happens now is that the table becomes active, the two server gets uh, checked, and if they are up and running, now the, uh, the request goes to those servers. And what this means is that now your server is back again, your service is back again, sorry. There's one thing to note is that if you keep it this way, as soon as one of the primary servers will go up again, the service will uh, fall back to that uh, particular server, which you may want or not, depending on the, the error, depending on you have to uh, start the server but make some checks on it. So if you don't want the, uh, fall the, 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 the failback, sorry, the failback procedure to, to happen, what you have to do is uh, disable the first, uh, the first table. Then what will happen is that, is that all the requests will still go to the St. Andrew server, and when, when you're ready, you just have to enable the, uh, the, um, the first table. Um, the previous examples were quite simple in the sense that it was one IP, one SQDN, one, one host name, let's say. What you may want to do is have your relay day uh, serve multiple host names, like uh, like in Apache, so you can talk about a virtual host. Nginx might be server blocks. I'm not that good at uh, Nginx, so it, it may be an error, but I think that's how it's named in, um, in Nginx. The idea is that you want your relay day to manage, let's say, uh, www my website and my uh, my cloud dot my net, um, my website. So how you do it is first you create your table for the servers. So here I've create, uh, created a table that's named blog, uh, which points to two servers. And I've created one uh, another one that says uh, that's named cloud and points to another server. In the protocol section, I have to manage the uh, certificate. In this particular case, I have one certificate for SQDN. You don't have to do this. To do this, you might use the uh, is it called server alias or something like that in the um, in the server in the um, certificate. But in my case, I mostly every time use one certificate per SQDN. So here you reference them. This means that Relayday will look for a file name blog example CRT and another file name in this example next cloud dot example dot CRT. It will load it and then you add you add uh, information to tell uh, Relady how to manage this. So first I I do what I what I do in PF which is block everything and start telling him what to allow. So in first thing I'm going to check the host header of the, the HTTP request and basically which what this does is says if the host is block.example then you allow it and you forward to the server that, that are referenced in the block table. And then if the host is cloud.example then you forward to the other table which is cloud. And with the block, uh, with, the, with the initial block uh, sequence if you try to come to that relay day and say, I don't know, it's a eurobsd.conf, it will just drop the, uh, the section. When you've done that, you have to modify also the uh, relay section and tell it, uh, tell it that the blog table will have to forward to a specific port. In that particular case, the, the, um, the blog table will forward to the um, to the two servers, the uh, the web host one and two, will doing the check the round robin check, uh, as we saw yes, uh, previously, and if it's going to 
if, if, the, um, if the header was uh, cloud.example, then it will forward to the table that's named cloud. So th this is how you do virtual hosting in Relabel. Another thing you might want to do is play on the path. I usually, because Let's Unscript is free, I usually get a fully qualified uh, domain name and a certificate. But some people like to do it with a path and say, www my website slash goes to the blog slash next cow goes to your next cow instance or whatever. And this is how you can do it this way. So the configuration is briefly the same regarding the, ta the, the table. What we will mostly change is the <coughs> protocol section. Rather than using the host header, what we say is that we want to, to pass or block request uh, for which the path looks like this one. So it in this example, I'm telling really that anyone trying to do CGI bin uh, request will get blocked off because I don't care. Uh, anyone that's trying to do uh, WordPress authentication will be, uh, will be dropped also because I don't care, they use WordPress. And the two last uh, just says that if the path looks like slash next cloud slash something, it sh the, the request should be forwarded to the cloud tables, which are the cloud servers that are running my uh, next cloud instance. And if it's not the case, then the request will go to the other table, which is my blog. <coughs> like in PF, the directives are uh, passed uh, in, in the order, which means the last matches uh, defines what happens. Okay. The problem is if I do pass request forward blog before the pass quick path next cloud, then if I do uh, slash next cloud, it will go to the blog because it's the first that goes. Um, okay, one sec. Now another thing you can do with uh, relay day is well solve problems. Uh, in this case, as I said, uh, the my backend server usually don't use TLS because I, I don't need to, and I trust my LAN enough uh, to not do it. And when you run things like Bakel, Mastodon, Search Engine, the thing is that the backend server will yell at you if you are running HTTP and say, oh, you're not secure, I, don't, I, I won't do anything, and you can't get content out of those servers. If you want to solve this with RealAD, what you have to do is tell RealAD to send a particular he uh, HTTP header to the backend server so that he knows that somewhere a TLS happens and that he can give you output. And this is how you do it. You take the protocol section and you do a match on the request, which is the thing that comes into uh, RealAD, and you set a particular HTTP header, which in this case is X-forwarded proto, you set the value to HTTPS, and this header will be added and sent to the remote server so that my Mastodon uh, server will get, for example, the whole request that has been done by the user plus that particular uh, HTTP request. And this will let him know that we're doing TLS, we're secured, so he can reply and, and does what he has to do. Another problem that you can find is that some applications are talking way too much. And what you see is that from the user perspective, if you look at the, at the header, you get lots of information that you may not want to be outside. Uh, if you're a real company and you don't want to have information like what's the server version you, you, you are using, what the application framework you're using, maybe there's some, you know, some information that leaks inside the HTTP header. So what you can do is you can tell uh, RealAD to check the response, the HTTP response from the backend server. And if they find something, they just either drop it, replace it, or whatever. In this example, what I'm doing is that if RealAD sees a response header that is uh, exposed by, which basically probably is done with WordPress or things like that, this header is just removed which means from the outside of my network, nobody knows, well, there, there are ways to know it, but 
you can't just use the HF data to see what I'm using. There's another use case. You can play with the server uh, HTTP header. In this case, I was just playing. So what I'm telling uh, RelayD is that every response that goes out of RelayD will have the server HTTP header set to Microsoft IIS. This may be me. This may be either stupid or just fun. The thing is that if you got uh, script kiddies that are just looking at your HTTP headers, then will they will try to do stupid things. So that's the one point. The other thing is that if you have old software, client software like I don't know Lotus Notes or whatever that expects HTTP header for whatever reason, you can force them to get the proper HTTP header that they that they w are waiting for, and this may help uh, working. Last thing you can do is some uh, some of the software you get on GitHub or whatever don't really bother about security and privacy of the user. And what this means is, is that some HTTP headers that can be used by the web navigator are not published by the backend server. So in this case, you can do it using RelayD. In, the, in, in this example, I'm setting three uh, particular HTTP headers, which are the X, uh, XSX protection, the X uh, content type options, and the permission policy. What those basically says is that I know that my uh, backend server is not publishing those headers, but I want the, the user navigator to have this information to know what he can do and what he can't. So using the match response header, I just tell that um, RelayD to create and to add those HTTP headers to the whole HTTP response that the user gets. And if you're like me and you have no idea what you're doing, you can go to the Mozilla Security uh, Observatory. It's a website. You just enter the URL of your website. It will parse it, and it, it will tell you you're missing this. You have this information. It sucks. It changes with something else. It's great. It's quite really, really well done. There's explanation for every HTTP headers. There's use case explained, so you, you can guess do you need it or not? Will you change it or not? What, what's the value to you? If you're using software like Nextcloud, they have a specific uh, website which called uh, Nextcloud Security Scan, which does the exact same thing. He scans your headers and he says, okay, we've noticed this, 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 this is good, this is good, this sucks. And this is when you can take those information and add them to your relay day server if you have to correct things. Now, log management. Uh, by default, what happens that uh, relay day logs using syslog. All the logs uh, are ha happen to uh, the daemon and messages logs, and they have those logs, which are, to my taste, not that friendly when you're trying to debug things. Basically, what you get is that you get information about what's up and what's down, and you get that kind of, let's say, weird information but really basic information of what's the request like and I find it sometimes a bit uh, complicated to understand you got the uh, the public IP and you get where it's going to but you don't know much about uh, what's happening so sometimes you need more information to get to correct uh, things so what you can do well first um, First, what I like to is have my uh, relay day log into a specific uh, directory, uh, directory file. So I'm just modifying uh, the syslogd uh, configuration. Oh, sorry. Good. Oh, no. Why can't I check? No, shouldn't. No, ninety percent. Uh, okay, let's try again. Uh, what happens if I disconnect and reconnect? Will it fail? No, that's okay. Okay.
point. Maybe not, it's not the right one. Thing is missing logs. Anyway, um, so w what I do is configure syslog to get this his own uh, um, log file for relay D. So I won't go into this. This is a simple example of how we do it with this syslog to get the, uh, the specific logs from relay D into a, a particular uh, file name. What's uh, what's uh, interesting here is the configuration of relay D to add things to the log file. Here, what we do is that we ask relayd to log the URL that he received from the user. We ask to log the host, the user agent, uh, HTTP header. And what we also do is log the response uh, here, the content type and content length, uh, HTTP header, so that we get those informations in the log file. And as you can see, we get something that looks a bit more like uh, Apache logs or whatever. You can, you know what the user is doing. You know where he's trying to, which path he's trying to get. You get the user agent, if it's important for you. And you also get the size of the things going out. So you can check a bit more things. So this is how we add those informations. Now, uh, do we check the time? Okay, so, uh, so this is the kind of, let's say, complex uh, things that you want uh, you want to do. So, on the left you got the the user side, and all the the right side is the related configuration. And what we're saying here is that where's the thing? Yeah, here. So you you enter the related here, and what we want to do is. We first want to check if the FQDN that we're using are uh, authorized or not. And if it's not authorized, then just drop the, uh, the request. Then if we succeed, we have three cases that we want to apply differently. Uh, on the top, what we want to do is that if one of the, t of the two FQDN that we've defined is those one, we want to apply logins specific logins. And then we want to improve the security and privacy as we've seen before. The middle case is that if the FQDN is something else, I call it number two, but uh, number three. But anyway, so we're gonna tag this particular FQDN and take action specific to this FQDN. And in this case, I'm gonna check if the source IP is authorized or not. If it's not authorized, then I just drop the session. If it is, then I can succeed and do something else. In this particular case, I add uh, HTTP cache control headers to get uh, PNG and CSS cache, for example, because my uh, stupid web server doesn't set this particular header. And the third, uh, the third option is that if the request matches another FUDN, then we're gonna check if the user agent is acceptable or not. If it's not, we drop. If it's acceptable, we can go forward. And then we can check if the path is okay, we can do things or drop the session. And then uh, if, it's, um, if it's all acceptable, uh, where does it, oh yeah. And in, in the last thing is that we want to drop uh, some specific headers because we decided that this header, those headers, shouldn't be shown to the uh, to the user. And when this is all done, we're going to the forward section of relay day, and the replies comes from the server and goes to the user. The whole dotted sections are separated in different uh, files, just to be easy to. Uh, read on the slides. You don't have to do it, but it may be a good idea if you want to do lots of things for different, for lots of FQDN different. In this case, you can use the, uh, the include function to get configuration from external files. So you got includes in your relayd.conf, 
and then you set up different files and set up uh, you you set up all your configuration in and when you reload it it will pass the whole uh, set of files so the first use case I'm creating a file at its name etc related slash um, dash uh, ssg.com for example and what we're doing is that what we're saying just previously we're checking for the headers so we will only authorize something that that is uh, www.example or something that is blog.example if the fqdm is not those any of the other um, uh, lines won't be passed why because i've used the tag section uh, the, the tag uh, keyword and this says that if the host name is www.example i put a tag which is named ssg on that http section and i'm going to uh, parse it uh, later on and this is what happens in the last in the last line i can match the header to the header host i set it to log that particular uh, variable in the in the log file only if the HTTP request has been tagged with that with that AS, uh, SSG for example word that I've used previously, so using tag and tagged, you can do those kind of uh, directions. So in this case, um, I'm just logging a bunch of things and then uh, adding a few uh, headers to the to the to the replies. Because only in the case that the initial case that the FQDM was one of those two uh, names that I've configured. The middle, uh, the middle fork was, for example, I create another um, an another file, and then I want to match something in the host header that is cloud example. And if the header is cloud example by then i use i set up another tag which i named nate cloud and then i do something with it that is if the requests are tagged with the next cloud i add some um some uh, some user agent uh, check and what i do is that i block them because for example i don't want google uh, google bot to come to my next cloud uh, and so on and do things uh, i also may want uh only a few people to come to the admin uh section of the next cloud instance so what i'm doing is that i'm checking if the request is from a certain uh, network address then i'm authorizing it if not i'm just dropping the uh, the um the request in practice it's a bit different what i'm saying is that i'm mapping every request that goes to slash admin to and I'm, uh, I'm setting a tag that is uh, forbidden and if I match the request and it comes from those IPs then I tag it next cloud and the magic <coughs> inside is is that the forbidden tag is never used elsewhere in the configuration so what happens is that the relay won't know what to do with those uh, requests and what happens is that they don't gain access to the um, to the path, so this is how I uh, block access to admin section. Yep. No, no. In, in in this particular case, I did the dirty way. <laughs> uh, what you can do is that you can set a tag forbidden, and this will forward to a page that said, "Get out of my way." For example, that would be the proper way to do it probably um, and then in the next cloud uh, example for, um, case for example I don't want the HTTP uh, server header to be published so I just drop it last example kind of the same same way uh, for for example Grafana I want the whole uh, website to only be accessible from a subset of network uh, ranges so I'm not working on the host uh, uh, HTTP header I'm using the URL which means that anything that looks like metric.example slash whatever will be passed and only allowed if the uh, source IP is one of those uh, two lines and I'm doing a bit of some more magic here 
what I want is I want to apply um, configuration only to um, only to objects that are already tagged. The problem is that I can't check. I don't think I can. Uh, you you can't get um, a, a header that is already tagged. Take the action and retag the same way. It won't work. You lady will bri uh, uh, will brag at you. So what I'm doing is that I'm looking for already tagged uh, headers, applying things and tag it with another things like we've done for the with the forbidden uh, tag. And in the configuration of the relady, what we're using is that that particular uh, second uh, second tag. This is why the cache control uh, header is applied to the uh, HTTP uh, requests that are tagged gcache and not the one that I will tag uh, Grafana. So when you've done this with all your files, what you can do is go back to your standard relady conf, and then you just got the includes, which are the in the middle. So what you would get is kind of same d uh, table definitions. You got your, in the protocol section, you define the whole set of uh, TLS certificate that you have. Then you include the configuration that you've set, and then you do the, uh, the task request. And in, ex in this case, what this said is that any request that has been tagged uh, SSG, for example, which was done in the ssg.conf uh, file, will be forwarded to the a table that is now uh, named blog. All the next cloud will go to the blog and all the Grafana and GKH will go to the uh, table that is named Grafana. And that's it. Yeah. Before we go to the questions, there will be a little change in schedule. Uh, there was a cancel talk uh, following up this uh, in here and we are uh, filling it that in with a uh, talk or panel discussion uh, from, from uh, Smart about uh, bringing together uh, small or medium-sized uh, companies with BSD developers uh, to fund little projects that solve specific little problems. Uh, this will start at the top of the hour and now back to the questions. Or I do have a question to, to the audience. Who's going to Azure BSD Con? and did not yet have Grof. We are looking for a person to take Grof home and bring him to Azure BSD Con. Not everybody at once. <laughs> yes, about that size. Is it you? No, yeah. couldn't hear that, but okay. Thank you. Right. Any questions? You mean having several re uh, related server? No, I think that if you have family server, then you don't need to have a server, then you can have only one server. Oh, uh, not really, because I'm using it on my personal web things. So there's, there's not much traffic. Uh, no, I've never reached. There was sometimes, uh, I think for Mastodon, I had to raise a bit the number of forks. Uh, yeah, forks. Uh, yeah. That was. No, no, I haven't tested it. The the only thing I've tested is running several instances of relay date. For example, here we have, uh, I've got a configuration that impl that includes three or four uh, FQDN. In reality, I have a server where I have three or four uh, different configurations for relay data and uh, three or four instances that, that, that are running uh, independently. Uh, 
never check. No idea. Oh, the whole questions. Uh, so there was a question about uh, reloading the configuration that uh, barely uh, stops all requests until the all checks uh, checks have are have uh, have been done by Relayday, which implies that the 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 whole web service is not available uh, until Relayday is uh, finished to check all the all the service. Other questions? Yeah. So you mean so you need the IDP and the logs to look at the traffic and the traffic to the source and the user. Uh -huh. And you will check that that is the data that you want is coming from the source and not from the user. Y you mean uh if if you need that data. Yeah. You mean do I do I maintain a list of uh, acceptable user agents? No. Well, each time I, I've checked the uh, the HTTP uh, user agent ed header, I I didn't have that much big things with login, etc. So I must admit I've never <laughs> done any check on this. Uh Because well, even in, in Nextcloud, I think that the the user information uh, is shipped in on u using other HTTP headers. Uh, so I've, I've never checked this. Oh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, so yeah, the the question was, uh, how can you manage the uh, the user agent when you get uh, both a user agent and more information in inside, and how do you how to split it to make uh, decisions or not. Other questions? No? Okay, thanks a lot.